שלום אביוואן, אין שבוע טוב, הוא יהיה פרשת ויחי. פרשת ויחי זה last פרשה of the uh, book of Genesis, and we have to learn what does it mean. Uh, <coughs> first of all, just a summary of all the previous פרשות. We said something very important. The high holidays of Rosh Hashanah, Til Simchat Torah, it's like we're going through an overall. And so after that, we need to download the first programs in order to operate, which is chesed for Avram, the giving, the sharing, the love. Without it, you don't, you're not alive. You need Yitzchak, which is judgment to put the boundaries, discipline and stuff like this, and the desire to receive. Okay, then Jacob to synthesize between the two because without it, you really messed up. And then you have to bring it down to the secret of success, which is Yosef, Sfirat Yesod. Okay? Last week, it was like <coughs> the completion because we had Yehuda, which symbolized our world, Olam Asiya, Malchut, and a human being that if you do not have this devotion of tapping up and going up to connect to God, to connect to the light, to connect to the higher realms, <coughs> if you don't know how to collide with that, then you're just living miserably lonely on this planet, and just you're stuck in your body, and your soul is yearning for, you know, what am I here for? And that was last week's Parasha Vaigash, from to collide with, to collide with, and tap into the spiritual world, the spiritual realm, <clears throat> the spiritual dimension. Now, so what do we need now? Parashat Vayichi. What do we have in this parasha? First of all, Parashat Vayichi, which is the completion of the whole Genesis, the last parasha. It's the shortest also in the whole book of Genesis. Only 85 verses, which is almost half of the average. <clears throat> but why, what I mean, why 85 and not 83? And in Hebrew, you know, every number is also a letter. 80 is Pe, and 5 is He. That gives you Pe, a mouth. A mouth means, in Kabbalistic definition, manifestation. You can think and think and think and think, before you said anything, you didn't say anything, you, nothing happened. The moment you said it, bringing back, that's impossible, right? So the mouth, to mouth something, that means to manifest. So this parasha is manifesting the whole book of Genesis, the whole book of Bereshit. So what is this book made of? What is this parasha made of? So we see, if we read the story itself, the name of the parasha Vayechi, simplistically, Vayechi means, and he lived. There are many commentaries about it, and we'll cover some of them because all of them are right, of course. But Vayechi means, and he lived. Who? Vayechi Yaakov. Think about it. It's the first time in Jacob's life. He is not running away from anyone. He is not chasing after anyone. He is not under the threat of being killed by anyone, okay? He has no any fears of whatever levels, he finally, he lives. 17 years. And what is 17 again? The number 17 is a code for Tov, numerical value Tov, good. Finally, he has a good life. Why? <clears throat> you know, he worked very hard so long along his life finally he is with all his children with his family with the grandchildren they are ruling egypt he's in the like in the royal family they are secure physically financially everything his son is the king of egypt which means that's nice. You know, everybody wants to arrive that place somehow. And if you think about it, 
It, didn't, it was not easy not to Abram and Sarah, not to Isaac and Rivka, not to Yaakov and Rachel, Leah and the others. They went through a very hard time, which is a very important understanding. It's like you want to know what the rules of life are about. These people who were the forefathers, not just of the Jewish people, the forefathers or the prototypes, they're called the fathers and the mothers in Hebrew. Avot vimot, not patriarchs. Patriarchs, it's a kind of a, I don't know, it doesn't feel right. The fathers and the mother. Why not patriarchs? Because you say, it's about, this is the patriarch of the family, it's like with the distance. When you say Avraham Avinu, Abraham, our father, you really mean he's your father. Sarah Imenu, she's really your mother. Rachel Imenu, she's really your mother. It's like, it's not something distant. It's very, very, re, uh, very uh, <clears throat> direct connection. Why? Because this is not somebody remote. This is someone that is alive within each one of us. Why? Because we need to install that chesed, gvua, tiferet, yesod, malchut, in each, inside ourselves every day of our lives. That's what the Zohar teaches us. So it's not something distant, something that you relate with. Oh, that's a great patriarch that, you know, once a year we go and to give him some respect. This is something that I can't live without it because that's a father and a mother. When we're saying father, in Hebrew the word is also avtipus, prototype. That's a prototype that on it, you know, when, when you build a program, what do you do? Usually, you don't take an app and you just start from the beginning. You take a skeleton of something that is already existing, a prototype, and you develop from that whatever you want. Right? Who can be so stupid to start from the beginning when someone, that's my teacher, said, don't ever do something someone already did. You know, built on top of it. Why do you have to start doing it from the beginning? You buy a computer. Cost you a few hundred dollars to uh, a few hundred shakers, maybe or dollars, whatever, to buy the, the basic programs to work on it, right? No, I want. I'll write it down by myself. You know what? You want to write down by yourself Windows and Google and Facebook and all of these programs by yourself? You're stupid. Oh, you you save some money, but at the same time you could write something nobody ever did and sell it for much more money if you're so genius. And you can, you know, write Windows 10 all over again, right? So you understand that don't start with something. And that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All of these stories that we have, this is to establish within ourselves the different aspects of dealing with life. And if you see, they were intensely spiritual, wise, powerful people. However... You see, that aspect of, I don't know, lack of maturity, when people say, but God, I am so good, how come my life is so tough? Excuse me? If you wanted an easy, nice life, you should have stayed upstairs. We came over here not to rest on our laurels, to remind everybody when you study Kabbalah, we came over here to turn darkness into light and to turn bitterness into sweet. We're not here to rest on our laurels. So you just like, you know, by the way, what are we here for? Your mother maybe told you that your goal is to rest on your laurels. And you know, a lot of people, they want to work really hard and retire when they're 30 and then just spend time on the beaches of who, who cares where. That's not what we're here for. And if you try to do that, your soul will scream, hello, hello. We're here to deal with the hardships. And that's why the Torah is telling us about people who are fighting with hardships all the time. Why? People have a nice, easy life without any challenges. They're not interesting for each one of us. Because that's not our goal in life. Okay? So it is a given that there are going to be challenges and hardships and all kinds of disappointment. That's life. 
Without it, you're not alive. The question is, if they give you a lemon, what kind of a lemonade you're going to make out of it? That's your creativity. It's not if you're going to get a lemon. You're going to get a lemon for sure. And not one, a whole basket of them. But you have to understand that this is what you're here for. You're not here to be comfortable. And a lot of people think that if your life is not comfortable and easy, it's a failure. No, it's not. It's a life. That's what life is about. So you have to understand that. So now we come into Jacob that he had 70 nice good years with a problem. Why, you retire? <laughs> you know, I once saw this video on YouTube of this lady. She was, she's 100, she was 100 years old. And she just got a, a new job. You know, she was uh, hired to, for one of the big, biggest colleges in, the, in New York to teach humor. Okay? And she was going to teach humor for that. And she was 100 years old like a, a person full of a lot of positive energy and laughter, you know, the perfect person for teaching humor, right? A granddaughter of Shalom Aleichem, one of the greatest uh, humor uh, writers in Yiddish and in Hebrew, okay? And, and the uh, interviewer is asking her, don't you want to retire? And she said, God forbid, I'll die. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not here to retire. We're here to do stuff. It doesn't mean you should have a paid job, but... You should be busy and taking responsibility about stuff. So what is this issue about Vayichi Yaakov Eretz Mitzrayim Shvayi Shana? He reached that place of good, but what does it mean? The Zohar is teaching us, don't you think that he rests on his laurels, okay? Still, he gets to that place of reaching that perception of good in Egypt. And Egypt is not just a geographical location. The Torah does not tell us insignificant trivia information. Egypt is not a physical location. It is, but it's also a place, a consciousness, which is, it's called the Achoraim, the back, the bottom. And the Zohar is asking this question. Amar Rabbi Yossi. And that's another interpretation of what, what I mean when he lived. Libo shel Yaakov, the heart of Jacob, Ra'ab bin Vua b'Mitzrayim, saw in Egypt a prophecy. Shebanav yu b'kama galuyot. He saw all the exiles that are going to happen to his children. Da'inu kol galuyot, all of the exiles. Shad Atava the Ketz Vizman Biata Mashiach till the end. Remember, this was written two thousand years ago. So he said that till the end, which means he saw everything, all the thousands of years of exiles. So you ask yourself again, why exiles? Why would the chosen nation go to exiles? And the answer is very simple. You want to rest on your laurels? <laughs> That's not what you're here for. Oh yeah, we we should sit and enjoy. Under our, vine our, our, under our uh, uh, fig trees and under our, you know, whatever, just the olives, just, no, this is not our calling. Our calling is to create. Our calling is to deal with darkness and turn it into light. Our calling is to take this world and when you're born into it, to make a difference. So when you leave this world, the world is a little bit more enlightened that it was before you came to this world, thanks to you. Because otherwise, what do you hear? Just to survive, just to exist, you're not an animal. You're a human being. And human beings have that ability to make a difference. Now, what kind of difference? Here we see. And it says, But Jacob arrived to that nevuah, that prophecy, it is called Vayichi. So what is Zohar saying? Don't look at the word Vayichi just simplistically as he lived. He lived? What do you mean he lived? Oh, he had a nice life. Yes and no. <laughs> There's a secret behind that word. Why? And we learn it many, many times. 
there are a human being has five potential levels of awareness each one of them is divided into five and each one of them is divided also into five so basically there are 125 levels a human being can go through also each one of them is also divided so you know you can go through a few levels of consciousness from the morning till you go to sleep correct if you're alive and when you say to live that's a special stage it's a code the first stage is called nefesh nefesh means you live you know how are you we live survive that's the animal level you make a living you live <laughs> i mean you, the fact that you make a living that means that you're alive not necessarily it means that you are sleeping along the day when you're sleeping i'm running back and forth you know don't you see people that are sleeping in bed and they're running back and forth right don't you see my rabbi used to say don't you see people like running around while sleeping getting out of bed and running around in the house and what if they, you never heard people screaming while sleeping so the fact that you think that you're awake it doesn't mean that you're awake the question are you really awake and aware for your responsibility that means alive that's the next level which is called ruach that's one above nefesh and then one above it it's like when you really understand your job in this world it's called neshama okay i'm not translating it to english because it's irrelevant you don't have this vocabulary in english okay but then there's another level fourth level which is much higher which is called chaya which is really connecting to the life force and when he says about Jacob Vayechi, he reached that level. That's the fourth level from the bottom. There was another person that arrived at that level, Moses. Where that's when Moses is saying, you show me your glory. And God says, that's a lot, but it says, the code over it is using the word chai. So Moses arrived to that level, the fourth level. There's another level, the fifth one, the highest one. Moses and the children of Israel arrived to that level on Mount Sinai. But during the sin of the golden calf, we lost that level. That level is called Yechida, unity. It's when all of us see the whole world as one unit. We see each other as one unit. That's basically the manifestation of the real word Shalom. You know, the word shalom does not exist in English. A lot of people think shalom means peace. No, peace is a Hebrew word. That means that people don't fight with each other. Lefayes. It's a, it's a Hebrew word. That means no, no fighting. That's not shalom. Shalom means wholeness. When you see the other person and you know that the other person is part of you, this is shalom. When you say, that's why... The word shalom is so powerful when you bless each other shalom or you say shabbat shalom you really bless the other person with wholeness to see that everyone that everything is part of you and you're part of it there's nothing higher than that Co complete oneness reaching that level that is the dream that humanity one day will arrive because this is our calling and then after that there's no darkness to transform anymore there's no bitterness to transform anymore, but that's a goal. And we got there once. That was just like a, what do you call it, taster. Now, after that, we have the memory of that. Now we know where we're going at. And the guide is the Torah, because it, is, it has inside all the, uh, all the clues out together. So Moses and, and Jacob arrived to that level of immense vision of awareness which is called prophecy however there's something very important in that issue that is called prophecy because the commentaries are saying asking so if that means prophecy there's a question every parasha in the Torah starts as a new paragraph except for one parasha Vayichi Vayichi does not start on a new paragraph. It starts 
is a regular space after the previous word of the previous parasha, and that word was in parashat Vayigash, when it says, Vayeshev Israel Beretz Mitzrayim, Genesis uh, chapter 47, verse 27. And Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, the county of Goshen, Vayachazubai, and they settled over there, Vayifu Vayibu Meod, and they got multiplied over there. After the word Meod, if it is another parasha, you need to have space and starting a new paragraph. Vayichi, there's a space of one letter, and there's no new paragraph. So that's called parasha stuma, locked parasha. Why it's locked? Why it's blocked? And the answer is, Rashi says, to show, Keivan sheniftar Yaakov, Rashi says, Rashi is the greatest commentary on the Torah. He lived in France in the 11th century. And he says, כיוון שנפטר יעקב אבינו נסתמו עיניהם וליבם של ישראל מצרת השיעבוד. Since Jacob passed on, on this parasha, the eyes of Israel were blocked to see because they started to be enslaved. Okay? דבר אחר, by the way, he took it from the Zohar, but he couldn't say that he took it from the Zohar. At that time, there was no permit yet to reveal the existence of the Zohar. Davar Acher, that's also another explanation, is using again the words of the Zohar. Shebikesh legalot et haketz lebanav, he wanted to show, and he said it, let me, just say, use the exact words. Okay. This is in chapter 49, verse 1. Vayikra Before he passes on, Jacob is calling his sons. Vayomar, and he says, He has to gather. And I will tell you, What I'll tell you what will happen to you in the last days. In the days, the end days. If you read the rest of the words, no prophecies, nothing. How come? Says Rashi, Shebikesh legalot et haketzer banav, he wanted to reveal the end days to his sons, venistam imeno, and suddenly it got blocked. He couldn't tell them about it. What do we learn over here? There are a few things that we have to learn over here that are so crucial before we go into a journey in life after finishing Bereshit. Yes, we need Chesed, we need Gvua, we need Tiferet. We need to know how to share, we need to know how to receive. We need to know how to synthesize, we need to know all of this stuff that we learn during the book of Genesis. But we, there's one more thing that we have to need to learn. People have this yearning, this desire to know what's going on. The worst thing that people should have is uncertainty. Like you see people losing everything. They lose their balance because they don't know what's going to happen in half an hour. Right? They're going into an interview and they've no idea what to expect for. They go nuts. They can get a heart attack. I saw people losing it, like, you know, people learned it with experience, with, you know, they're very mature, they have no idea what to expect to, and that gets them into such pressure, they can get a heart attack, a stroke, just because of uncertainty. They want to see the picture. And when you have that wish, that I want to see the picture. You go, did Avram see the whole picture? Never. He made mistakes. Isaac was coming. God was telling him that Isaac is coming and going to be born. And he is praying for Ishmael. Right? Uh, 
Isaac and Rivka, they're praying for a child, a child, and they get, you know, they have this anxiety, okay? And then later on, you, you see it, they're humans. And as a human being, to have free will, it means knowing the future is, they call it, it's a spoiler. It is a spoiler. You don't want to know the future. Why? Because the moment you know the future, you cannot feel ownership on making it happening. And that's why, you know, you asking and you pray for stuff, don't spoil it. Don't mess it up. If Jacob reached such a level of prophecy that no human being arrived to, only Moses. Did Moses see the whole thing, the whole future? Not either. Why? As long as we are here, we're not supposed to see the future. So the, what, what I'm supposed to, you don't you pay a lot of money for analysts and all kinds of forecasting, forecasting, soothsayers, once they call them soothsayers. They have no idea, but at least they tell you, they lie to you. We know what's going to happen. Did anybody foresee 1929 uh, collapse of the stock market in Wall Street? No. 2008? No. So, you know, so why are you paying such a fortune? Because, you know, it's comfortable. Somebody says, you know, he knows the future. He lies to you. You pay him to lie to you, and you feel comfortable he's lying to you, but in your subconscious you know he's lying, but still you still feel comfortable because I did my best to know the future. You don't know the future. That's okay, that's part of the game. This is part of the game. Certainty is not about knowing the future. Certainty is knowing that you do your best and God will do the rest. That's certainty. And what was God going to do for you? You don't want to know. Why? It's outside of your box. <laughs> you don't want to limit the blessings. You don't want to limit your life with the old logic. That the old logic is just there as a spacer. Just to feel that you know. You don't know. You don't know. History is full of people that they knew it, they didn't know. You know, I love this story about Alexander Graham Bell. He invented the telephone. He goes to all of the CEOs of the great American companies to sell them his patent. And what do they say? We can't see how you can make money for two, by two people talking through a wire. Yeah, so the poor Bell had to open his Bell company by himself because nobody wanted to buy the patent. Finally, Bell Company became so big that the American government was afraid he's going to swallow it up. The whole U.S. government. So they forced Bell to split into a few companies. Correct? AT&T is one of them. Bell South is one of them. There's so many Bell Companies that came out baby of... Bells. Right? The baby Bells. The baby Bells. Why? Because yeah. it became so big. Thanks to whom? The short side of all of these CEOs of the great American companies. Nobody could really get it. So, somebody, somebody's blindness is always somebody else's blessing. Right? So, assuming as a certainty that in any given moment I do not see brings you into a place of serenity that is worth a trillion. I do not see, and you know what? It is okay. I will do whatever I can from my authentic, most pure place, and I'll do my best. Then God will do the rest. Where is it going to come? Don't spoil it. It will come from the right place when it's the time. Don't spoil it. That's what certainty is about. Certainty is not about using your previous logic 
that created the problem in order to limit the solution, correct? That's as a faith, that is a way of life. You could see all of the fathers and the mothers, they live like this. They don't know exactly, it's always like hints. God is saying, you just trust me, I'll bring you where you need. When God is telling Abraham, and Abraham is saying, how do I know that I, my offsprings will get this holy country? And Rav Ashok is saying, what does it mean? And what, because God's answer is, you should know that your children are going to be slaves for 400 years in a strange country. They will be enslaved, tortured. Finally, they'll come out of there and they will get the land. And that satisfies Abraham. And Rav Ashlag is asking, what's the connection between your question and the answer? And he says, that's very simple. Abraham says, when I grew up in Ur, south of Iraq, I worked so hard to find the truth. You know, every time I saw a little bit more truth than I saw before. So I was wandering around. I was trying to look for what's the real thing. Did I find the whole real thing? No, I don't think so. Because that's, a, that's not just one lifetime journey. But I journeyed. And I looked for the place. And I arrived to Haran. And from Haran to Knan. Until finally I realized that this is the place. This is the gate of heaven. I know, I paid for it dearly. I have ownership over it because I went a long way to get there. But you know what? Parents have this problem. You work so hard. You reach a place of maturity, of self-accomplishment, kind of an awareness of maturity, which is faith. It's a mixture of faith, self-esteem, and trust. And you see your kids starting that road and you cannot give it to them because they have to mm. earn it by themselves. Bread of shame. You cannot give it to someone. They have to get it themselves. You can only inspire. You can only guide. You can't force it on someone. So Abraham is saying, I know it cost me dearly to get here. But my children, they will be born over here. They don't know anything else. How would they earn that precious right to connect to their holiness? Connecting the earth and the heaven. That's how you understand God's answer. They will be foreigners in a strange land. They will be tortured and enslaved. So when they come out of here, of there, they will earn it. They will come from darkness to light, from slavery to freedom. Now they will earn it by their, on their own right and merit. Now Abraham is happy. Why? You cannot do it and make it for others. And that's also one thing that the Torah is teaching us. It's a journey. You want to be happy? Just being righteous does not mean that you'll be comfortable. Being righteous means that you know to play the game. And that's why King Solomon says, Sheva ipol tzaddik vekam. A righteous person will fall seven times and get up. Just a second. I thought that a righteous person is perfect. They never fall. If you fall, shame on you. A lot of religious societies make this mistake. If you fall, that's a shame forever. This is not the Torah. If you fall, that's the way of the world. Abraham never fell. Sarah never fell. You know, the, the, the whole 24 books of the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, the writings, never describe you a person that never fell. Why? They're not relevant. If there's someone like this, they're not human. Humans fall. That's what they do. They make mistakes. Now you got a lemon. 
Now we want to see how you make a lemonade out of it. You know, you can make this kind of a lemon, a lemonade, this, you can make this kind of a lemonade. There's so many flavors. Make your own special, unique lemonade that nobody ever made before. That's your journey. Seven times you fall and you get up. Falling is human. Not getting up, that's failure. Not getting up, not trying all over again, that's a failure. So who, you know what's failure? The one who failed are the one who don't try to get up again. This, this is failure. Because that's giving up. And Rav Ashley is saying giving up is aging. Is, uh, is being old. Not the number of the years. It's the giving up. You can be old and 21. You can be young, 97. Right? So... Jacob shows us you can reach the highest level <coughs> and it doesn't mean you see everything. And that's okay. It doesn't take even a little bit. You know, people, people get really embarrassed if you don't see the whole picture. You're not supposed to see the whole picture. <laughs> it's not fun if you see the whole picture. That's called, again, a spoiler. So what is Jacob doing? He's giving blessings. Oh, blessing is something else. The art of blessing, that's a skill, because what are we here for? How you turn a lemon to a lemonade, that's called a blessing. Mm. To bring the blessing down, to bring the ideas, the effort. You know, a lot of people, they make a lot of effort. Does mean, it does not mean it becomes from darkness to light. When you make the effort in the, right, in the wrong direction, <laughs> it doesn't make it necessarily light. When you make the effort in the wrong direction, it doesn't make the bitter sweet. It can make it even more bitter. Correct? Mm. So when you make the effort, you have to make the effort in the right direction. It has to come from the right place. A lot of people, they make a lot of effort, but it's coming from a lot of pain. From a lot of, of, of anguish. From a lot of despair. That doesn't make it better. Because that's not connecting you to bracha. A blessing. And we have a lot of brachot over here. But there's something special about those brachot. Those blessings are being given to the 12 sons of Jacob. Which is, what are the 12 sons of Jacob? Why do we need to know the 12 sons? Why do we need to know how they were born? Why do we need to know what are the blessings Jacob gave them? How do we, why do we need to know what are the blessings Moses gave them? Why do we need to know where they camped in the desert? Who cares? That was so long ago. It's wasting a lot of words. Ha! Huh? The Zohar teaches us that these 12 sons of Jacob complete the picture. What did we have? Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Chesed, Gvua, and Tiferet. Every person has these three aspects. What else do we have? We have Joseph, the manifestation to funnel it into this world. We had Judah, Yehuda. This is us. But what is us? You look around, and the us is so colorful. Wow! As the sages, our sages are saying, seven and a half billion people on earth, the same way, two people don't look the same, they never think the same. Wow! Why is that everybody is so, if everybody would be like me, everything would be so amazing, beautiful. What a stupid thing to say. <laughs> Why? Because if everybody will be like you, you'll be redundant. <laughs> because there's so many of you. The fact that there's so many people and that each one of them is different, each one of them is, as you get into the story, 70 people come down to Egypt with Jacob. 70, each one symbolizes another nation. 70 nations. Why 70 nations? How many colors to the rainbow? Seven. Each one of them is divided into 10 spherot. It's 70. 70 nations. That's the 
it's one number to show the scale of humanity. If you know any kind of a nation, are they all the same? Oh, they're so different from each other, right? Even in one village, everybody's different. Even in one family, everybody's different. Why? Because the same way the sunlight is made of so many endless different shades of colors. That's how humanity is made. Each person has to light his shade because without my shade, the whole color is not white. What's a white color? It's all the shades together. That's the shalom. That's the wholeness. But that starts either from 70, but that can go into 12. 12 sons of Jacob. That represent the 12 signs of the zodiac. How do you know? When they camp in the desert, Parashat Bamidbar, and it says that the camp, Ish al otot levet avotam. What is otot? Signs. Now, what, what's the connection? Zodiac signs? How do you know this is zodiac signs? It says so. Read Genesis, chapter 1, fourth day. The stars in the heaven have been created by you le otot moadim ushanim. They will be for signs for the holidays and for the years. Signs. It says signs. That's what the stars are. That's what the signs and that's why the tribes are also. Do you want to control the zodiac signs? Here you have the ability in this parasha. The first parasha, they gave us the ability to control chesed and gvua. And if this parasha, Vayichi, is giving us the blessing to control all the 12 signs of the zodiac within, within which one of us. And to be able to see the blessing in, among, in the people around us. To see if I see another person, as we said, that person will never be like me, thank God. Will never be me, thank God. He will be him, thank God, because he needs to reveal his shade of color that I cannot reveal. And I have to reveal my shade that nobody else can reveal. All of that together, that gives you what is called shalom, the wholeness. But, so we have inside us, according to Abraham the Patriarch, Avraham Avinu in the Sefer Yetzirah Book of Formation, that each one of us is made of all 12 signs. No one is just one sign, chas v'shalom. God forbid, that would be too much. So we all have our zodiac sign, the month we are born, then we have the ascendant sign, the time we are born, then you have the physical location, then you have the planets in which house each one of them is where, you know, that's the, the chart each person has. That shows that we all have all of these combinations. So through that, let's say when you want to relate to someone who's a water sign, you have enough water and earth in you to find in you something to relate to that person. And if the person is a fire sign, you can find inside you a fire and an air so you can relate to that person. And by this, we can stick to each other the same way in chemistry. All of them can find a way to relate to each one and then you create a whole big network because, and it comes from one place, when you understand that you need them and you need them as they are, not as you think they should become. You know, most of the biggest problems on earth in history of politics was when somebody wanted to bring a solution to the problems by making everybody uniform, like what you think is right. The 20th century was the amazing experiment. The result was, I think more than 100 million people were killed because of trying to impose uniformity on humanity the way someone decided is right. Let's say according to I, the way I think Marx decided is right. Or another philosopher. Okay, but... That was also the history of religion during the Dark Ages. Why it was so dark? Somebody decided what's right. 
whoever doesn't fit into that should be killed. Millions of people were killed. See, there was not too many millions to kill anyway, right? So Europe got empty. Many vast lands were empty because of killing so too many people who were thinking differently. Okay? So here, after understanding that, we have to come to the blessings. And there's a big, big, big learning over here. Because when are you blessed? That's a question. Because Jacob is giving blessings to his sons. These blessings are basically, what is a blessing? We're starting with a blessing. Why? Because, what did we study before? That the world was created with a letter bet. Genesis, Sefer Bereshit, is starting with a letter bet. Why? Because it's a letter of bracha, a blessing. What do we finish with? And the book of Bereshit with brachot. You start with the bracha, you finish with the bracha. Bracha means the ability to bring the bliss from above to below. And how do you do that? How do you get, let's say you're running a business. You Let's say you have any kind of relationship with anyone with you. The highest level of being a human being is that when you interact with another person, you get the best out of them. You inspire the best out of them. You know, when people are being declared negative and terrible, does that mean that anyone who is in touch with them will feel terrible? Not necessarily. There are people who know how to get the best out of people around them. This is a blessing, right? Because you awaken that part, that vibration, that flavor, that shade of color that that person came to give humanity. And that's a blessing. If you don't know how to tap into it, then you find what you don't like. You're not supposed to like should accept and learn how to activate the blessing within the other person oh this is not easy right and it's not all it's not always successful you know we are not perfect but that's your job so the Zohar speaks about the blessing and first of all in this parasha for instance there are very clear instructions for blessing because the Torah says even very simple Okay, Jacob is, is starting with the blessings that he's giving to the two before. He blesses all 12. He's doing something very special. He's asking Joseph to bring his two sons. And he nominates the two sons of Joseph as two tribes also, Menashe and Ephraim. Why? That gets it into 13 tribes. How come? Oh, the answer is very simple. If you know the Hebrew calendar or the Chinese, or the Hindu, or the Thai, or the uh, all of East Africa, uh, your, uh, Asia, they're all built like the Hebrew calendar. They are lunisolar calendars, which means you count the months according to the moon, however you count the years according to the sun. And that means you have cycles of seven leap years every 19th cycle. In every leap year, you add one month. So there are 13 months in that year. You go, you see the Chinese, the Hindu, all of them are the same. Now, like the Hebrew, because all of them are based on the spiritual ancient knowledge. And a lot of people lost that knowledge, but it's still you can find it in the Zohar and in the Book of Formation. So there's one month 
that needs once, seven times every cycle of 19 years, he needs to become two months. Which month is that? The month of Adar. Adar is Joseph. Why Adar is Joseph? Adar is the sixth month of the winter. Number six is Yesod. Yosef is Yesod. Another thing, the word Yosef, Ki Asaf Hashem, that's his name, to gather, in Aramaic, Idra is a gathering. Also, it's Pisces, right? And Pisces is fish, and Idra, in Hebrew, is what's left when you eat the fish and you have these bones, fish bones left behind. That's called Idra. And what's a symbol for Pisces? Two fish, Menashe and Ephraim, Adar one and Adar two. You see that? So now, after Jacob nominates Menashe and Ephraim as two tribes, now he can bless the others. Because now the system will be finally totally complete. But when he blesses them, and you know that Joseph is a symbol for blessing. And we know that that symbol of blessing, we read it because it says, uh, I'm reading in chapter 48, verse 20. And he blessed them on that day. What did he bless them? With you, Israel will bless, saying, God will make you like Ephraim and like Menashe. And what is the blessing? First of all, so every Friday night, every beginning of a holiday, Jewish fathers bless their sons. They put their hands on their head and say exactly the same. This blessing. God will put you like Ephraim and like Menashe. And what was the blessing for Ephraim to Menashe? That's in verse 16, chapter 48. The angel redeeming me from all evil will bless the boys. And my name and the name of my fathers will be called upon them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham, and Yitzchak. And then, they will multiply like fish. Here it's very clear that Jacob appoints them to be Pisces, fish. To be fruitful and blissful like fish within the land. And that's the blessing. The Jewish fathers are blessing for thousands of years from that day and on till today in Jewish household every Friday night. These words exactly. For the, for the sons and for their daughters. Right? So you understand that it's like this, this parasha Vayichi is teaching us how to bless others. And blessing others is not just blessing your children. Blessing others is also arousing the good within someone else that is with you. Because if that person is with you, you know, God sent him over with a gift. And that gift is something you need that you can't have it by yourself. That's why God sent you the other person, because he has something that you need. And that's, we, that leads us to the next thing in the Zohar. I'm not going to give the whole uh, the whole article, but in the Zov, Perusha Sulam, it says in uh, verse 376 for Vayichi. Every place that you need to bless, first you have to bless God. Why? You can't just bless yourself, because who are you? Are we the sun or the moon? We are the moon. That's why we count moons, by moons. What, what's the difference between the sun and the moon? The sun shines even at night. How do you know? The moon is light. 
you see the moon lit because the moon reflects the sunlight that is there even at night. The moon does not shine all the time because the moon does not reflect. The moon has only the light it reflects from the sun. God is like the sun. The sun symbolizes God. This is the ongoing flow of bliss. The moon has its cycles. We don't have, like the moon, our own light. We have only what we reflect from God. So we, when you want to bless someone, you have nothing to give him. So you have to do what? You have to open the funnel to God. And you have to channel it from above. Otherwise, you have nothing to give. Because you are the moon. The moon has no light to give to anyone. Only what it is reflecting. But if the moon is turning its back to the sun, say, no, I have it on my own, that's death. Never, ever try to get the blessing from a person. The blessings only are from God. The person could be the catalyst to awaken the blessing, the blessings, but the Zohar says, the way you bless is first you connect to God, because that's awakening the bliss. But if you don't bless God first, you didn't turn it on yet. Okay? You're not connecting to anything. Then the blessings, you can say any blessings you want, they would not apply and they would not get fulfilled. If you're going to say that Jacob that his father blessed him. But he didn't bless God. Starting from that. And he answers. Come and see. When Isaac is blessing Jacob. First he's blessing God. Now that he blessed God. Then he's blessing Jacob. How do you know? Let's say. There is a Misha Berech. It's a blessing in a synagogue. Mm -hmm. Right? Somebody went to the Torah. Somebody, you're blessing someone. What do you say? Misha Berech Avoteinu Avraham Yitzchak Ve'yakov. Whoever blessed our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or our mothers, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, he will bless. You first connect to the source. The Zohar says, when you say any kind of blessing, Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu. When the moment you say Baruch, you have to concentrate on awakening the bliss from above. In the word Baruch, you have Kaf for the Sfirat Keter. You have the Reish for Reshit Chochma. You have the Bet for Bina and the Vav for Dat. First, you have to awaken the source of bliss from above. Then you funnel it down. Ata, Aleph to Taf, to the Hay, which is our level Malchut. You bring all the bliss from above, A to Z, down to here. Elokeinu, left column. Melech HaOlam, up and above together. All of this is one thing. You're not blessing God. He doesn't need your blessings. He is the bliss. But what you're doing, you, you open the funnel for the blessings. So the Zohar is saying, why the Torah starts with the letter Bet? Because the Bet is a blessing. What is the blessing? Look at the letter bet. It has a roof that symbolizes the upper world. It has a bottom that symbolizes this world. And it has a line connecting the two because without connecting the two worlds together there's no bliss. If the bliss stays up above, it's not the bliss because nobody enjoys it. If you're not connecting to the above, you just sit here, <clears throat> there's no bliss because you're dark. You're sitting in the dark. You need to have all three dimensions. The upper world, the lower world, and the ability to connect between the two. That's a bet. Now, you're coming to the end of Bereshit. Now you will to learn to do it by yourself. You have to learn from Jacob how to bless. And that blessing to bring it down to others. You want to be blessed by yourself? First of all, what? Make sure to bless others, to know how to bless others. And how did 
Isaac do that, when he blessed Jacob, he says שכתוב, he starts, ויומר, and he said, ראה ריח פני כריח שדה שברכו השם. See that the smell of my son is like the smell of the field that God blessed. Immediately he's turning it on. He turns the switch on of connecting to the source. He knows, like the moon, he has no light of his own. He has to switch it on, the blessing. Okay, and what does it say after? Ma katu b'chara? V'yitel l'cha elokim den, and God will give you. Mital ha-shamayim mishunayas. The dew of the heaven and the fat, the oils of the earth. Kevan shesadeh u'shu ha-malchur, this field is this world. Already existed with that, these blessings. From there, all the blessing can be funneled. And that's why a person gets up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? You bless. You make the first 18 blessings because you want to connect yourself to the bliss flowing in the universe. After that, you can bless others, you can become a blessing to others. But not before you connected yourself to, the, to become online on the network of blessings. Boy! So... There's so much in this parasha, although it's only 85 verses. There's a whole volume of the Zohar just about this parasha. But that's enough for today. Thank you, Shavua Tov, and have all the blessings.